everyone. Welcome to the Charvak podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right. So today's podcast is titled The 10 Worst Policy Decisions in History. Now, I'll give you guys a brief background about it. So Abhijit and I have this thing we try to talk about different subjects or interesting subjects that challenge us intellectually and challenge you intellectually. So while we were discussing what do we talk about it struck me and abhijit that you know we always talk about policy what policy making is how x is bad or y is bad so we were like you know we should actually talk about some policy decisions as examples that are disaster so this is going to be a series right this is part 1 we're going to we may end up having a part 2 or a part 3 also we also don't know it depends on how it goes and uh, having said that abhijit buddy welcome as always Praise be to our Lord in Christ. I hope all you heathens who are hearing this accept the uh, the one true message of the one true God and change your evil pagan heathen ways. Thank you. All right, good. Uh, so Abhijit, um, before we get into specific policy decisions, I want you to first start by clarifying. when you say policy decision, and when we are talking about policy decision, we should clarify what it means because. we don't want to be in a situation mm. where any kind of decision making is considered policy making so let's be clear in explaining mm. that and then you start with your examples right so uh what happens is see when i was looking at policy you look at the official definitions of policy which you get in dictionaries and things like that they refer to very short span things and for me when i was looking at the 10 worst policy decisions as cumulatively today we're only going to discuss five because there's too much to discuss uh, and i didn't want to make a very very long uh, podcast so when you're talking about policy how do you differentiate it from a decision right now one of the things about policy is how do you also differentiate it from say a cultural trait So one of the things I'll show you is this German technology obsession or quality obsession. How it's actually the result of calculated policy, because sometimes cultural traits also come about because of a decided policy taken at some point of time, which then can mutate into a cultural trait. But the point is, we're looking at second order, third order effects today, because that is something which you know in India we never look at, like we've seen with. either 370 abrogation or farm laws anything you don't count the second third order effects that happen after a point of time so i wanted to bring all of that together and so for me policy the way i've defined it is basically it's not just one decision it's a string of decisions or a set of decisions repeated over a point of time which give it a kind of continuity and obviously when i say 10 worst policy decisions this is my take on it it's a very indian globalist take on it but it's you know everybody's thing is different and mostly i've gone in for global examples because you know this thing that somehow india is unique we have nothing to learn from somebody else i think that's wrong we do need to learn from other people's mistakes there's no point reinventing the wheel even though mahatma gandhi wants all of you to keep spinning the charkha over and over again So that's why I chose these specific things. Cool. All right. Then then let's get straight into uh, the five examples now. So let's start with example number 1. So what do you think is the first pr- case? Okay. So the first case is the first bad policy is something that starts under Bismarck. It's German over engineering. Now you'd all be looking at Mercedes and Audi and BMW going. Ben Chowdhury, what are you crazy? Is it German overengineering? We all want German cars. How are you saying this? Well, you know what? Germany has the exact opposite of India. Here we look at technology that we can't make as a solution to our human problems. There. they saw technology as the guide they also prioritize technology the way india does but where india uses it as an excuse for its human problems or as a placebo for human problems the germans 
look at it as an expression of their technological prowess, which actually leads to a lot of problems. So see, both ends, unless you're able to calibrate it, lead to problems. Now, remember, till Bismarck really takes over, German quality was considered shit. I mean, today, this might be very strange to you thinking that, you know, uh, German quality is shit. But... For most of history, uh, German Christian history, since Germany, well, the agglomeration of states that became Germany existed, they were mostly seen as producers of crappy products. Nothing really good ever, high quality uh, ever really came out of Germany. Uh, it was always considered a sort of uh, the hangover, I guess, even from the Roman period, barbarians always producing barbarian stuff. And its reputation was one of low quality goods. That changes when the ministers, it wasn't Bismarck, it was various ministers under Bismarck, took a calculated decision that whatever we do, we will be best. And, you know, this came from very much from the mindset that influenced Bismarck's predecessors as well. Remember, Voltaire was a part of Friedrich the Great's court, Friedrich the Great being, uh, well, the king of Prussia. And uh, the Prussian House of uh, Hohenstaufen, uh, well, technically the, Brand uh, the Brandenburg House of Hohenstaufen, they just call themselves Prussian, becoming uh, uh, the emperors of Germany ultimately. Uh, so it was very influenced by the age of uh, enlightenment and things like that, and specifically by Voltaire's quote, that the best is the worst enemy of the good enough. So they came to this conclusion, no more good enough, no more jugaad in the Indian sense. And we're going to make the best of everything, the best locomotives, the best cars, the best this, the best that. And this policy was put into action. Now, the problem with this policy was that the amount of engineering and material and things that used to go into producing and still go into producing this technology is very frequently not worth the trouble and it can have disastrous consequences very, very quickly. And let me give you an example. This is something you think a country like Germany would have learned from its mistakes. Uh, you know, we keep accusing Modi of not learning from his mistakes, but the Germans also don't learn from their mistakes. And I'll give you a simple example of how and why. So uh, the first time when this new focus on great quality was implemented was just before the Franco-Prussian War. And by this time, remember, Prussia had already industrialized. Prussia was effectively Germany at that point of time. So this is where looking at the 1870s, right? And by this time, Prussia had industrialized. They had uh, gone pretty uh, 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 far ahead. They were producing fantastic things. However, the French, remember, had started their industrialization almost 100, 150 years before the Prussians had. So in certain things, they were way ahead. Now, what people don't realize is that in the Franco-Prussian War, the French technology in most things was better than the Germans. Okay, the French Chassepot rifles were better than the German rifles. The French had the first version of the machine gun. It was called the Mitralus, you know, my name, Mitra, with a L-L-E-U-S-E -E at the end. The problem was they suffered intensely. The French rifles could outgun the German rifles. Uh, and the French machine gun could have wreaked havoc on the Germans. But the problem that happened was that German cannons manufactured by Krupp at this point, you know, Krupp steel is very famous, were better. They had one thing that was better, one piece of equipment that was better, and they had infinitely better military tactics. Okay. So what happened was the French, now, how do you use a machine gun? A machine gun should be put in front of artillery, uh, in front of infantry, so that you kill any infantry or cavalry attacking, right? But the, uh, but the French didn't do that. What they did was they thought of this new gun, the Mitralus, a machine gun. We'll call it the machine gun for ease was the same as artillery. So the, instead of using it to protect their infantry, they used it to protect their artillery, which was anyway outgunned by Prussian artillery. And they lost the war quite spectacularly. 
because what was happening was the German guns were going on killing off the French infantry. Now you can out out fire a German rifle, but you can't out fire, but a French rifle can't out fire a German cannon. So they got slaughtered. Your French uh, artillery, which technically should have included this machine gun to devastating effect, was not used. Now, based on this one freak example of better tactics and one cannon that was better than the French, they got it, the Germans got it into their mind that quality is everything, quality is best, and so they strived for everything. It should have technically been a counter example to Voltaire, where sometimes the mediocre can be the best, uh, can make mincemeat of the best. Uh, they did not. They took the opposite lesson. Why? Because they won the war. See, a victory is always seen as a validation even of mistakes that you make. And then those mistakes get institutionalized, which is why they spent too much on quality. What then happens? In World War I, they genuinely think their quality now is so good, be it in submarines, be it in anything else, that they are going to win this war. There was no doubt in their minds. They thought it was going to be a swift victory. And so they never rationed. Uh, and by two thirds into the war, they were starving. There was literally starvation setting in Austria-Hungary. There was starvation setting in Germany. And at that point, internal politics completely, nobody looks at the industrial angle of World War I on the German side. But industrial production was really suffering at this point because the raw materials couldn't come in. And what raw materials came, instead of producing lots of things in bulk, we used to produce a few boutique things of great quality. Okay. Again, if the Franco-Prussian War is an example of how a victory can whitewash your failures, a defeat is also sometimes whitewashes your failures. They put it down to Jews, which is why the Holocaust and Hitler come about, money lending, etc., etc., policy failures of the Kaiser and the generals around him, Ludendorff and... Uh, 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 Hindenburg, and they never wanted to actually examine the industrial policies. And so in World War II, they repeat the same mistake. Now, the submarine, you put in so many years of development into it. Your entire large parts, not entire, but large parts of your naval budget are going into the, making these fantastic submarines, which are technological marvels, except the Allies spent a lot less money developing the sonar at which point they could detect you and shoot you down. So you spent so much. Do you remember that scene from Indiana Jones and uh, 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 the Raiders of the Lost Ark in Egypt? This trained Egyptian guy comes and he's sh showing his sword all around. Can you imagine how much he learned the sword? It would have taken 20, 30 years of training before he could wield the sword like that. And Indiana Jones just takes out his pistol and shoots him through the head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was one of those kind of situations. The other thing that happened was they were so badly. I, uh, one of my former colleagues, his grandfather was a, uh, a, a submarine officer, an engineer on a submarine. And he was telling me that each submarine required 8,000 different gauges of screws just to fix. So instead of taking about 15, 20 different gauges of screws, he had to take a whole inventory of screws that took up a huge amount of space. And sometimes they would run out of screws because each one had to be precision engineered to a certain this thing. So even the repair and maintenance of these submarines was a nightmare. You also see this with the Tiger tanks. So after the Panzers started getting evenly matched out by the Russian T-34s and things like that, they come up with the Tiger tank. And do you know with the Tiger tank, twice the number of Tigers were lost on the Russian front to equipment failure than they were to the Soviet army. Why? Because they were over-engineered. So when you are over-engineered, you tend to fail. This is so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. Next, the V-2 rocket. Now, the V-2 is the precursor to every single ballistic missile that we know today. Every ballistic missile that we know today has some kind of technology that has come from the V-2 rocket that Nazi Germany developed. Right. But it was... 20 times more expensive 
than the equivalent of a plane taking several times the same payload and depositing it somewhere else. Now, 20 times the expense does not justify, but they were very proud of it and they continued wasting money manufacturing it because it could not be intercepted. The problem was it never hit its target. Right. So there was this huge technology obsession that went on happening out there. I can show you in there are lots of thousands of smaller examples. So remember this policy of the best, the best, the best technology, 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 focus on technology, better technology will help you overcome your problems, etc. Now you begin to see the relation to India as well, right? Where everything is, Hamara sukhoi kaam nahi karta hai, let us buy the Rafal. We don't have this. So we buy technology, etc. It, it's always we don't focus on the human being, we focus on the technology. Same trajectory, and you will see that even today. To this day, an ordinary Maruti Suzuki, say an Ertiga or a Desire or something like that, you can drive it through about three, four feet of water and the car will not stop. You take a bloody German car, a BMW, an Audi, a uh, Mercedes, and you drive it through one, one and a half feet of water. Half of what? I'm sorry. Dogs are... Where are you? Anyway, uh, you drive it through one, one and a half feet of water. It will stop right there. Okay. You look at all the insurance lists of the most unreliable cars anywhere in the world today. Eight of the top ten anywhere in the world will be German cars. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. They pack it with so much technology that the failure points increase manifold. Right. Now, you think the more technology you have, the less failure you should have. Right. Uh, no. The more technology you have, actually, the more failure you have. It's sheer probability. You remember in one of, was it our programs or some other program I'd said, one of the reasons that, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, Kushal, I think there's somebody at the door. I have to go get this. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, so I'll, I'll handle it over here in the meantime. All right, everybody. So in the meantime, Abhijit comes. I'll tell you why I had typed, uh, how am I sounding in the live chat? So as you know, I'll be traveling to North America. So I had packed up all my entire gear. But I still had to conduct a podcast today and tomorrow before I fly out. So, you know, I was like, kya karu, kya karu. And it just happened that, you know, there is there's this company called Walt. Yeah, you guys can see this. So they sent me over a microphone to try out. It's just uh, they said you can try out the mic. And I was like, OK, I'll try it out. So I'm going to try it out today, tomorrow and for a few days. So I was like, hmm, nice of them. Let me try it out. So I wanted your feedback. So if you guys could tell me, you guys listen to, I know some of you listen to me every day, all, almost every every single uh, you know moment. So what I am requesting all of you is that, uh, how is the audio sounding? If it is sounding good or bad, uh, you know, let me know. So. Let's see, you know, uh, this is the mic. If you guys want, you can also buy it. I am not paid for anything. I'm just being clear. They have just sent me to try this mic, uh, you know, sent this mic to me to try out. And right. So I'm trying it out and I wanted to see. Oh, obviously, once the podcast is done, I'm going to go and hear myself. And now we have Abhijit a year back. So let's get started again. Abhijit, you'll have to unmute yourself. Praise be. Okay. So, you know, this has actually had very serious consequences, which have never been fixed, incidentally. There are two high speed, two major high speed trains, train technologies in Europe. One is the French TGV, and the other is the German ICE. Okay. Now, the TGV actually compensates for human failure. So, they do human checks on everything, they do a full human checking of the rail cart, of the uh, uh, rail tracks, everything. The ICE does not. The TGV to date has not had a single fatal crash. The ICE has. 
And the reasons for that crash, when you read the investigative report, huge crash, some hundred odd people died, uh, which is a lot in Germany, uh, were entirely because of uh, 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 an over-reliance on technology and not using humans to fix faults. So there's a lot of things that keep going wrong with a lot of German technology, but because the entire system is so invested in technology, 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 they never try to fix it. The answer to technology failure for them is not to take a step back. It is to use more technology, increasing the number of failure points. So coming back to what I'm saying, I think it was in this podcast or another podcast, when I said the belief that a four-engine jet is safer than a two-engine jet was comprehensively busted because this is why four-engine jets, in addition to fuel expense of four-engine jets, uh, which could not sell, which is why the A350, uh, sorry, the A380, the jumbo jet double-decker, is being phased out. Uh, and why the A340 never sold was because the twin jets uh, turned out to be much more successful and reliable. Now, think about it. You're thinking... To pagal hai kya? Redundancy of four is better than redundancy of two. No. If you have four, the probability of failure is also fourfold. Okay. Four engines, something can go wrong. The plane gets stalled, etc., etc. Two engines, there's only a 50% chance that something goes wrong. But the reliability is so high that you don't have to even worry about that 50% chance, which is why today the entire market is twin engines. There's a very long article. For me, when I read this, I was like, you might all be thinking, Ye kya ka kya bol raha hai karke. but I would urge you to buy at the early 2003 or four. Uh, think about it. It's called Airbus versus Boeing by René Fancillon. A uh, fantastic article. It opens up your notions of probability and things like that with engines and reliability in a way very few things have. And it was discussing why the A340 failed and why its competitor, the Boeing 777, succeeded. And a lot of it had to do with also the fact that Airbus had over-engineered its product, whereas Boeing had retained manual controls for a whole load of its product. And the moment Boeing over-engineered a product, the 737 MAX, for example, which was overriding human controls, you saw the two crashes that happened and Boeing 737 MAX has now lost market share completely to the A320. And my, so, you know, this is something that I hope in India also we look at, that this obsession we have with technology solving other problems is an extremely dangerous thing. So this would be number one. Now, I'm not doing this. Uh, this is not a countdown, right? The problem with countdowns and listicles like this is they're so subjective uh, that, you know, you'd say like, but why this, why not this, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, So for example, one of the things that came up was, are you going to include Prithviraj Chauhan's defeat at the second battle of Tarain? Well... <laughs> It wasn't a policy decision. What you should really be asking is, maybe he lost, but why did every other Hindu king then fail after that like nine things? And we have another set of podcasts there to discuss that, including horses and uh, the Turkic invasions and things. So that's a different thing. The second thing, since we're talking about Turkic invasions, is the Turkic habit of hostage taking. Okay, now this developed in the steppes where in order to negotiate, you would always send a hostage. And very frequently, the hostage would be executed when your promises weren't met. Now, uh, you know, Iran as we know it today is, isn't is really Iranian that much as it is Turkic. I think we've discussed this previously, you know, how about out of 1,400 years of Muslim history, only 200 are Arab years and the remaining 1,200 years were written by Turks. Iran is one of those countries. It is almost entirely ethnically and otherwise Turkified, linguistically even Turkified, ling uh, not in terms of grammar, that remains an Indo-European grammar, but in other ways, every one of their ruling dynasties for the last thousand odd years has been Turkic, more, uh, almost 1,400 years has now been Turkic. And this sort of policy 
this nomad policy of hostage taking and executing hostages. This is diplomacy. So one of the worst policy decisions in the diplomacy is this continuing mindset in Iran of hostage taking without looking back at their policy decisions taken before. One is a mistake. Two is policy. Remember, that's the thing. Bad policy, but policy nevertheless. Okay, it's a repetition. So what happens is, you all know about the Mongol invasion of Persia, right? How does it start off? Mm -hmm. It starts off because the Khwarezm Shah, again, the Turkic Shah, uh, 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 in Samarkand at that point of time, uh, had these Mongol ambassadors executed. And the Mongols, for them, the ambassador was sacred. And they said, you know, you've executed our ambassadors. You have to uh, pay compensation. And he said no. And that is when the Mongols came. And the poor Khwarezm Shah, he ran from one corner of his empire to another corner of his, corner of his empire, destitute in absolute poverty. He didn't even have money to feed himself. And he died of hunger and disease and pain in an isolated island in the Caspian Sea. That is how bad he ruled an empire half the size of India, modern day India, maybe slightly more than half. And he died a penniless beggar isolated completely in the middle of the Caspian, not in the middle, but on an island in the Caspian Sea. But why is this one episode? Because you see that this execution of hostages, things, hostages, ambassadors, whatever, it's a continuous feature of Iranian diplomacy, which they've never seemed to learn. Now, if you remember, the last time an Iranian ambassador was executed was by Sparta. Sparta and Athens both executed, you remember the famous 300 Spartans movie. This is Sparta and they kick the Persian ambassador uh, into the bell. So the Athenians, the story is the Athenians threw him uh, into the sea saying you collect your water and the uh, Spartans threw him into, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the Spartans threw him into the well saying collect your water. The Athenians threw him into a gorge saying collect your sand because the traditional sign of submission was sand and water. Uh, and, you know, the Persians invaded and they lost very, very badly. It almost destroyed their empire. Uh, so it's actually even a pre-Turkic. Of course, they were the ones doing the hostage execution at that point. But hostage execution, bad decisions taken based on impulse like that. You can't go back on it. So coming back from the Mongol invasions, sometime around the 1870s, 80s, I think it was, the Iranians decided that they were going to have a fabulous riot, which was sponsored by the uh, Shah of the Qajar Shah at that time, uh, which was going to target Western interests. And accidentally, on purpose, the Russian ambassador was killed. And obviously, the Russians invaded. The Russians invaded. They seized all of Azerbaijan and most of what is Transcaucasia, Chechnya, Azerbaijan, all of this was seized during that campaign. And the Iranians had to pay a huge indemnity, including the Nadir Shahi diamond, which is now in the imperial treasury in Moscow in the Kremlin. They had to give them several massive diamonds uh, in return. And then you'd suspect that after your entire country has been destroyed by the Mongols. And understand this, the Mongol destruction of Persia was so comprehensive. In 1236, when, uh, sorry, 1220s, when the Mongols destroyed Persia, it took 600 years for the population of Persia to come back to pre-1220 levels. It was only in the 1800s that the population of Persia reached the same level that it was before 1220. Okay. And uh, you think that by this time after the Mongols, uh, Chalo Achaemenid Empire, of course, the Spartans made the mistake, but you kind of ended up paying the price. And after what happens with the Russians and the Russian ambassador, you think you would have learned your lessons? No, they take Americans hostage. Now, if you remember at that point of time, America was still willing to make a deal with the Iranians. They're like, look, you've gotten rid of the Shah. We didn't like the Shah too much. Your guys, we can deal with, make, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, be anti-American, but we'll cooperate in private. That hostage, taking 77 US diplomats hostage, completely destroyed any chance they had. 
And after that, every single attempt of theirs to break out of that diplomatic isolation started getting countered ferociously by the Americans. So you look at the number of Iranians who died, almost 600,000 of them, close to a million of them died in the Iran-Iraq war. Totally avoidable. Why? Because America decided to egg on Saddam Hussein to attack Iran. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you look at the Iranian losses in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq to date, in all these international things to date. All of that stems from that one policy decision of hostage taking where you make an implacable enemy of somebody. So in a sense, what they did to the Americans with the hostage taking was what they had done to the Russians with the hostage taking at a much lesser level. The Russians let them go easy. But in many ways, you can say that in terms of foreign policy cataclysm, it was the same as what they did with the Mongols. So this hostage taking and diplomat execution is one more big policy uh, thing we should look at. Again, like I said, is this a cultural trait or is this a policy decision? And like I said, a repetition of policy, a repetition is what makes it policy. So cultural yeah, traits I, can mutate to policy. I just, I just have, uh, so, so can behavioral patterns be policy decisions? I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah, they can. Behavioral patterns can impact policy decisions. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, because behavioral hmm. patterns would lead to your thinking that leads to your final decision. So yeah, fair enough. Exactly. Right. Uh, so it's things like that. Then, third bad policy decision. Socialism. Socialism <laughs> kills. Now, uh, this is such, I mean, we could do like 15 podcasts on the effects of socialism killing. Now, I think there's enough Russia, the USSR, China, Vietnam to show you how badly Venezuela, to show you how things kill. But in this one, I wanted to reverse that policy making slightly and focus on the four countries that are given to you as an example of socialism success. The Nordic model. Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland. Okay. Now, <coughs> everybody is like, when you show them Hugo Chavez, they'll be like, oh, but look at Sweden. When you show them uh, 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 Mao Zedong, they'll be like, oh, look at Finland. When you show them the failures of Stalinism, they'll say, oh, but look at Norway. You know, things like this. So what happens is, I want you to... Uh, there are lots of books on uh, 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 the economic histories of these four countries, which you'd really need to read, where, you know, unfortunately, because of the current, uh, there was one particular book, it was very strange. Uh, I forget the author now, but it was the economic history of uh, uh, Norway, I think. Uh, no, uh, what was it? Of, of Sweden. And amazingly, the online edition, I remember reading the same author when I was a kid, uh, and I downloaded the online edition sometime back uh, from Libgen. And what ended up happening was I was looking for the same paragraphs that all been removed. They'd all been removed because these days criticizing socialism is a bad thing. So they're actually censoring books out. Now, what you need to understand is that these countries, Norway was dirt poor. Okay, through most of the 1800s, Norway and Denmark were dirt poor. Sweden was actually quite rich, but it chose a kind of public spending path quite early on. By the 1860s, 1870s, they were in public spending. They got into serious debt. On the eve of World War I, they were on the point of a fiscal collapse. And at this time, socialism hadn't really taken off, but it was still quite socialistic without saying socialism. And what came and saved them? Guess. Guess, Kushan? Well, uh, don't they have the lowest corporate tax rates in the world? No, no, no. What saved them in uh, 1914? War? What will happen? World War I. Right. Yeah, war will Manufacturing will be... Or economy booming. Not, not even manufacturing. They were able to sell. They were able to sell weapons to both sides and basically uh, use war profits. You know what's called price gouging. Yeah, yeah. To to rescue themselves from the war. But then after the first world world war, you actually have full scale as in named socialism set in. 
Mm-hmm. Before it was socialism in all but name. After World War One, because there was such a huge, they made such bumper profits, and like idiots, they decide to spend it all. Oh, those evil so, capitalists! No, 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 evil socialists, technically. And then, on the eve of the Second World War, they're in the midst of another economic crisis, on the midst of another collapse, and guess what happens? World War Two! Oh. Yay! And then, on the eve of World War II, this time their bumper profits, they actually made three to four times the amount of money. Because by this time, they actually had industrial goods and things like that to sell. Uh, Before, it used to be coal and things like that that they had to sell. This time, it was uh, actual finished products. So the L-40 gun, the Bofors L-40 gun, for example, uh, the shoulder-fired bazookas and things like that, these were all the things that they sold to both sides both to the allies and to the Axis powers, and they again made a bumper profit, which (laughs) saved them. Now, thankfully, remember, socialism is much more disastrous when it's duplicated over a large scale than it is over a small scale. If you look at Sweden's population today, it is less than the population of South Mm Delhi. Okay. So it's very easy, and mind you, in spite of easy in small scale, they averted two major economic collapses through war. Now, they've learned some kind of fiscal responsibility, yes, but the one part of Swedish society, and in fact, most of Nordic society that they won't tell you is, it has one of the highest outward migration rates per capita. Scandinavians migrate in droves to America, Australia, and the rest of the Anglophone because they just don't want that tax burden to be happening. Okay, so you still go there. You will think that Nordic migration in percentage terms would almost be as bad as some kind of a refugee country trying to get out. Mm. Anybody who's even halfway really talented who stands out, if you are run-of-the-mill normal, you'll be perfectly fine because there's no reward for overperformance. But there's no punishment for underperformance. So if you're a lower to okay kind of worker, you're perfectly fine in Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark. But if you're ambitious, you want to shine, etc., you get the hell out of there. Okay. And this is why people keep talking about IKEA. What they won't tell you is the idea might have been Swedish, but all the production used to happen in Poland. Mm -hmm. And even now, a lot of the production happens offshore. But they don't want Swedish. It's it's marketed as a Swedish company, though it's still marketed as a Swedish company. Uh, But it isn't. Well, I mean, it is. Uh, You also look at new entrepreneurs it's the lowest. To this day in Sweden, the Wallenbergs own everything. Okay, Saab, Volvo, well, not Volvo anymore. Volvo is now Chinese. But uh, uh, Saab, uh, uh, the shipbuilding part, Kokums, which then became a part of Saab, etc. It's all owned by one family called the Wallenbergs. Okay, so you have mm-hmm. that concentration into old wealth. And socialism serves as the perfect way of defiling it. So this is Sweden. Next is Norway. Norway was so dirt poor that when they asked for their independence, the Swedes said, please take your independence and get lost. They didn't even try to hold on to Norway because they considered them semi-civilized barbarians, uneducated people, hill folk, forest folk, whatever. And what saved Norway? Norway was a dirt poor country. When does Norway become rich? Any idea? I think Norway would start maybe in the 60s and 70s, right? Yeah. Why? I honestly don't know why. It must be some conflict again because most of these nations are conflict uh, profiteers. Oil. Not sea oil. Yeah, well, I'm in conflict again. Yeah. So it was not sea oil. And they've pretty much invested every, uh, to be fair, they did pretty well with uh, uh, 
uh, how they managed it. They didn't overspend and go binge spending. Uh, but apparently they've spread themselves too thin. And now the problem is the Norwegian pension funds, according to everybody, is in serious, serious trouble. So when Norway comes crashing down, it's going to come, cra come crashing down absolutely spectacularly. So remember, socialism, like we've seen, in Sweden, socialism was saved. In Norway, socialism did not lead to the wealth. Oil led to the wealth. Socialism was the result of that oil. Okay. Socialism nearly collapsed Sweden. War saved Sweden. Okay. It's still the capitalist keeping Sweden afloat. It's not the socialism keeping Sweden afloat. Yeah, and Denmark. for the record, these countries have one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the world. And the reason these countries are able to do redistributionism, what they call socialism or democratic socialism is, as of now, 80% of their population is still paying income tax. And at what rates? You're looking at 50% tax 50, rates almost. 50%, 50. If you're, if you're richer, it goes up to 60, 70% sometimes. It's insane. Which is why nobody man. wants to live there. It is insane. It is truly insane. And they are so brainwashed that the average mediocre Norwegian or Swede or Dane or Finn that you talk to will tell you, we're very happy paying those taxes. We want to pay taxes. We want this. Except when you talk to a truly exceptional Swede or a Finn or a Norwegian or a Dane who's actually inventing something, it's no longer in Sweden, Finland, Denmark or wherever. It's outside. Okay, mm -hmm. this continues to be the problem. Uh, Denmark, again, dirt poor. It was an agricultural country. No real future, no real prospects, nothing. It had been completely destroyed in the wars uh, prior. How do you think they became rich? Well, which one? I forgot the name. Uh, Den Denmark. Voice... Denmark. Denmark. How did Denmark... I, I, I have no clue. I am not a history student, man. Guess. I, I... Guess, guess, guess. Just wild guess. I don't know. It can't be war because I don't remember them being involved in any kind of war. It's war. It's they war. Also... Yeah. All these fuckers, they... man. They, all these fuckers, all they do is fucking profit off a of war. That's all yeah. they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it was profiting off a of war. Specifically, you know how? This was, again, price gouging during war. It was pork sales. They were very good. Oh, at yeah. Pork. The pork. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Even now, it's. I think it's Denmark's big top 10 exports. Is one of, they're, they're the biggest supplies of pork to Europe. Right. But they really took off and started making their surplus during the war and especially the post-war phase through pork sales. They invested it very smartly. But remember... They took advantage when you're a population at that time of four or five million people maximum. Reaping bumper sales of pork throughout Europe. You know, it makes you very rich. It makes you very, very rich. It's literally like, I don't know, in Bombay, uh, well, I think uh, Lower Parel would have a bigger population than Denmark. So think of a smaller area. Uh, Malabar Hills. Okay, Malabar Hills. Yeah. If that the, if that that's the level of population we're looking at. Yeah, Malabar Hills is the level of population you're looking at. If they sold off the rest of Bombay at market rates today, assume the rest of Bombay was sold off by Malabar Hills, and you distributed it to Malabar Hills, every Malab every resident of Malabar Hill would become a billionaire. Hmm. Okay, it's like that. It was disproportionate sales of pork that made Denmark rich. And since then, they invested pretty damn well. And yeah, again, but in the so gains of the Danes, also colonization also must have played a role, right? They were colonizing some places. They, right? Well, they didn't have big... Look, none of these four countries, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway, ever... Uh, some of them never colonized, like Norway never colonized, but ne none of them ever had big colonies. Uh, and when I say big, I mean in terms of population uh, or extraction. Because uh, remember, Greenland, which is several times the size of Denmark, is a Danish colony. It continues to be a Danish colony even today. Okay, But there was very little that you could actually extract from Denmark, uh, from uh, uh, Greenland. Too cold, 
uh, you know, the technology for permafrost drilling and things like that a long time. So even now, Greenland is considered a depressed part, you know, the um, uh, extremely high alcoholism rates, abuse rates, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, out there. So uh, again, problem. Uh, so again, Denmark is one of these things which sheer dumb luck. It was war profiteering that led to that profit. And, you know, once you make money, you have to be very stupid to lose that money. Okay. Extraordinarily stupid to lose that money. Uh, so that is Denmark. Finland, dirt poor again. How did they make their money, Kushal? What are the probabilities? Again, war. <laughs> a cold war. Uh, not the war war, but a cold war. This time it was Yeah, cold. because... The Cold War and uh, because they naturally, they must have profited through that, uh, the whole yeah. Russia and whole thing. You Again, know? very, very small population. And it was something called the Finnish shipping cluster. Okay, so what happened was Finland was ideologically and otherwise aligned to the West. But because of the World War II settlement where Finland was recognized as having defended itself and not waged a war of aggression, even though the terms were harsh, it was allowed a certain level of political autonomy, which no other country except maybe Austria was given. And so what happens is the Finns, who had access to Western technology, became the exclusive suppliers of Western level technology to the USSR because they had to be in the USSR sphere of influence, so to say neutral, but completely subservient to the USSR. And they started up something called the Finnish Shipping Cluster, which was using their access to Western markets and technology to come up with their own propulsion, to come up with their own ships and sell these to the USSR. Now, again, you're thinking like pork sales. Uh, remember, Kapil Sibyl's wife runs a butchery and you know where Kapil Sibyl lives and how many hundreds of crores he has. So remember, butchers can make a heck of a lot of money. They can make hundreds of crores of money. Uh, mm -hmm. If you remember that whole tiff between Barkhadat and Kapil Sibyl over, uh, what was that TV channel that we started called? I forgot. Yeah, Tiranga, Tiranga, Tiranga channel. Uh, so again, here, uh, ship sales, small population, huge influx of wealth. Uh, and the second part of it was actually selling paper. Uh, lots of pine, they make uh, 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 lots of newsprint and things like that, paper and uh, log and things like that. So they invested in, they invested smartly, to be fair to them. But again, all of these come with a timeout period. The timeout period is you've become very rich, but innovation ossifies and all your truly creative population is going elsewhere. So socialism, remember, these four, you keep claiming that they are the rules that prove the principle. They are actually the exceptions that prove the rule that socialism kills. So socialism is number three. Number four is mercantilism. Very often we confuse mercantilism with capitalism. So uh, I've combined a few things together. Mercantilism and uh, well, essentially mercantilism because even de internal colonization and wealth transfer happens because of mercantilism. Right? So I want to give you three examples of this. The first is the south of Italy and the north of Italy. Today, when you talk about Italy, it's constantly the poor South and the rich North. South ke log sab kaam chor hai, and the Northern Italians are the hardworking ones that sustain the rest of Italy. That was not the case. When Italy was unified under the Piedmont, Piedmont is right, Piet, Piet is foot as in podiatrist, uh, Mont Hill, at the foot of the hill, so at the foot of the Alps, it's a Northern part of Italy. The Piedmonti Savoy family became the ruling family. It was unified under the Savoy family of rulers. The north was the poor part. The south was the rich part. It had huge agricultural surpluses. It hadn't been destroyed by war, etc., etc., etc. And what happened was full internal colonization. All the excess wealth of the south 
was taken and it was transferred to the north. Now, uh, you can actually go through the land records and things like that. I spent a lot of time in the uh, library in Noto and uh, uh, Palermo looking at these things, which I needed people to translate. And I could, I mean, only a tenth of the time that I spent. Can I ask you a, a, a question here while you're looking it up? Yeah. But when you say mercantilism is like bad policy, I mean, it made the British freaking rich. But it also destroyed them and it ended, no? It did, but look at, and I mean, they the sit on didn't... the laurels of their colonialism and mercantilism, right? True, true. Uh, I'll come to that later. We'll do that in after I've finished explaining this. So right. there's a very important book called The Leopard by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampredusa. Uh, I want all of you to read it because this kind of explains the entire... Uh, I'm going to hold this up. I don't know if you will see it nahi yaar, nahi dikh ra. okay yeah now it's slightly clear the leopard yeah summaries.com something written on top yeah yeah uh it explains how the sicilian nobility are so upset by this wealth transfer that they decide to try to stop it they fail ultimately but they decide to try to stop it now these are southern italian stories which you'll never get to hear that get whitewashed completely Remember, the first train system in Italy was connecting Naples to the south. It wasn't in the north. All the surplus was then transferred to the north. And the north industrialized. And for a long time, the north was maintained in order to maintain the northern supremacy. The South was not allowed to industrialize. Essentially the same British kind of mercantilism that you want a market to remain backward so that they continue to buy your products. What the British did with India. Okay. Now, this same thing you also see happen in Belgium. In Belgium, there was a very clear divide between the North, which is the Flemish speaking, and the South, which is the uh, French speaking, called Wallonia. And what happens out here is the south is where all the old industry was. Coal, steel, ArcelorMittal, a lot of it is located in the southern part of Belgium. The northerners were considered the uh, like Biharis are today. Tum Ake, do the landless laborer work here. Now, the good thing was that they learned industrialization. It wasn't building in Delhi, building unskilled building in Delhi. It was actually skilled jobs in collieries and steel and manufacturing and things like that. And what happened ultimately was that they did not allow, the Southerners did not allow the North to develop. They simply would not invest in the North. But then the information revolution comes. The South is stuck in stasis, but the North then adopts the information revolution and it becomes the more developed, richer part. And this has happened within our lifetimes. This has happened through the 90s and 2000s. You could see the transition happening in the 2000s where till the 1990s, Northern Belgians were considered barbarians and then uh, uh, today they're considered the uh, posh people, whereas all the poor people come from the South now, are French speaking. So mercantilism. Now, let's look at the British. Did it make the British Empire rich? Curiously, if you look at it, it did not. It made it very powerful. It gave it a lot. But did you know India stopped paying its bills by 1911? By 19, after 1911, it was Britain subsidizing India and not the other way around. But see, with mercantilism... If you were to look at it that way, I think in my view, Abhijit is not fair because you have to look at the totality of the resources that the Brits took out of yeah. India. And yeah. then then maybe in 1911, it starts getting uh, to them that they have to shove money in. And then you calculate 1911 to 1950 or 45. And then you subtract that, subtract that from the one they took. Right. And then you get a fair now, answer, right? Uh, you remember what, again... Uh, if you actually do the maths, it doesn't work out. So, for example, uh, what is Shashi Tharoor's estimate of the total amount of money that's been taken out of India? 
I think he was something around a trillion or something he had said in his book. I forgot the exact amount, but I'm not relying on just him. I'm relying on uh, the two other work, Paul by Roke and uh, Angus Madison. Although Shashi does use Angus Madison to be very fair. He does. He does. Uh, so what do you think the per capita income uh, was in, say, 1890? I don't remember, man. I have to pull it up because i don't remember these figures on the top of my head i know british uh, the british colony had become richer than us way before that uh, i think per capita income of england or india you're talking about and in terms yeah, of dollars or of, rupees of, of of the uk i was assuming hoyega tabhi us time pe 1500 2000 tak ho chuka hoyega i'm assuming i don't remember honestly mere ko bahut time ho gaya wo angles madison ko padh ke country up to that point. they had become richer than us though much richer than us that's yeah. a different matter we're not talking about relative aha uh-huh. we're talking about in real terms yeah the Britain real in comparison to many other uh yeah in comparison to many other hmm. the real wealth that you see of britain today comes because of margaret thatcher shifting from the old models which had again been destroyed by socialism because remember the whole point was that nationalization of industry and all of that that had happened under clement attlee and uh, heath and all those people she reversed all of that privatized everything turned it into a financial superpower which is where the real wealth of britain comes about okay so there was a huge disparity even there the gini coefficient was massive Okay, the poor yeah, were dirty. Yeah, but still, what... the Brits were, in comparison to others, they were still very rich. Although they were not as rich, if we are looking at extrapolations today, but they were still very rich for those standards at that time, right? At look, there, there's no denying that they were very rich at that point of time. The point there is, it's an unsustainable model. No, it becomes like socialism. you have to keep extracting and ultimately it goes down in the end britain was subsidizing india so for 50 years of our colonization britain ended up not 50 uh, 1911 to 47 kitna hua 35 years 35 36 years yeah uh, they were subsidizing us not the other way around mm. Mm. Uh, you can almost say that mercantilism ultimately destroyed the british empire and why do you say that because this is something the americans learned very well they learned this vedic mantra you know uh, uh, sahana bhavatu sahana bhunatu sahviryam karava bahi tejasvi namati utavastuma let us play together let us eat together let us prosper together all of that when everybody becomes rich your markets keep expanding with britain the markets never expanded or they expanded at very nominal rates do you know india grew at the same rate as britain that it did after independence the hindu rate of growth 5 to 6% sometimes 3% etc 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 it actually always grew under the british unlike say during the tughlaq or delhi sultanate period where it never really grew okay so there's a lot to be said again it's a mixed record but if you look at mercantilism and the overall impact it had on britain it ossified it as a society it laid the seeds of its destruction it in a sense what could have britain could have been like america it wasn't i'm just taking britain as a simple example uh you take spain just one exactly. point i don't know correct me if i'm wrong but if i remember correctly india under the mughal rule you know they always spin this around as look how the mughals were good for india but what they don't show is the income disparity under the mughals in india was way more than the british 70% of the national income was controlled by 655 families yeah And 70% i i forgot with the paper with 655 families i forgot the uh, paper wo bahut important paper tha 
uh, I had spoken about I, it on the podcast. I did a whole, I did a whole bit names. about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and let me give you other examples of mercantilism. Uh, you know, there's a lot to show that Rome did not operate in that way. Mm-hmm. Rome, because see, the Roman vision is that everybody is Roman. If you've come into the Roman world, like, you know, we discussed this, how they were Arab Roman emperors, how they were African Roman emperors, how they were Spanish Roman emperors, etc. For them, it wasn't a racial construct. It was a civilizational construct. Like we have in India, you can be from wherever. But if you worship our gods, if you speak Latin, if you think you are Roman, you are a Roman. Which mm. is why it was called Mare Nostrum. Our sea, the Mediterranean was called Mare Nostrum. Everything around it was integrated in. You could all be Roman citizens. The elite in every part of that empire were turned into Roman citizens. Right. St. Peter and St. Paul were Roman citizens. Even though they were Jews. Okay. So... The Roman Empire was run very differently. We need to understand this from post. For example, the Roman Empire had slave trade. But you never had the kind of slave trade in the kind of volumes that the transatlantic slave trade became. So remember, those late European empires functioned in a completely different set of things. Another example, Spain. Spain, before Franco takes over after the Civil War, is one of the two or three poorest countries in Europe. And this after extracting all the gold and silver from South America and Mexico. Hmm. So mercantilism does not work. This is the amazing thing. Yeah. Which is why. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just just so that, you know, uh, I remembered the name of the paper. It was by W.H. Moreland who did the study of medieval India. Uh, It's called a study in economic history. So if anybody is interested, I thought I'll just share it for the, our viewers. They can go and read the paper. Just put it on this thing, no? On uh, uh, Add the link to it on... Uh, uh, the paper will only get from JSTOR. Where will it be from? Yes, okay. Put it in the link. Uh, let them buy some JSTOR single one-time access and get it. No. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do it. Let's just give them the you access continue. To You continue it. Okay. So this was one more. Um, and incidentally, the same kind of crap happens in India as well. Uh, what you call internal colonization. Bengal, for example, was the most industrialized state. It developed, it was essentially a backwater, it was a malarial backwater till the British came. The British industrialized it, much more so under Winston Churchill when it was forced industrialized. The Bengal famine was exactly like Stalin's Holomdor. Uh, famine resulting from forced industrialization kind of thing. And if you remember that podcast that we did with Kanchan Gupta, where he told you, remember how that jute and cotton pricing, uh, the evenization of the pricing, destroyed destroyed Bengal's economy within four or five years flat. Yes, yes. Bengal's wealth was wiped out by Nehru in four to five years flat. He de-industrialized Bengal. And nobody ever wants to talk about it. I think you should get Kanchan Gupta and talk to him about that specific thing. Okay. I so will. it was deindustrialized. Why? Because if you look at the industrial policy resolutions, especially the nasty one of 1957, what Nehru did was essentially a kind of a colonialism in a different form. He wants money to be socialist. So he starts nationalizing everything that makes a profit and runs it into the ground. Mm -hmm. So essentially what the British did, he did to his own people. Insane. He was no different from the British. In fact, the British were better because at least they industrialized Bengal. But because he wanted the surpluses of Bengal, he de-industrialized it. For all effects and purposes. Right. So this is the problem that happens out there. So this is one uh, uh, very simple example uh, 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 within India. And nobody talks about it. So I think you should do a podcast with Kanchan Gupta just about that particular thing, Kushal. And finally, the last one, because it's relevant today, not just because it's relevant today, because I think it's going to have grave consequences for the rest of the world, is uh, how much time do we have left? We have time. We have time. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
got another half an hour. So let me finish this off in the next three, four minutes. Is yeah, yeah. the decision of NATO to remain intact after the Cold War and start expanding East? Really? Man. Yeah. Now, why? Now, you think it's only European? No. The biggest headache is for us. No one is more endangered by NATO expansion East than India. Why? Mm -hmm. For a long time, Indians would keep our... There was one thing that was very clear. We always had to prevent Russia and China from coming together. Two huge powers in Eurasia coming together is never a good recipe for anybody. And because it's us, for us, it is particularly bad. Because we're number three. So if one and two get together, number three is going to get screwed. Which was never a good idea. So we always strive to break the Russia-China axis. The Chinese perceived Nehru as doing that. One of the reasons they got upset with Nehru was because he tried to break the Russia-China axis. And in that, he actually succeeded quite well. Okay, though Khrushchev did more and uh, Mao Zedong's own personal ego did maybe more. But Nehru definitely tried to exacerbate that fault line, create that sort of uh, uh, competition between the two so that they break apart. NATO expanding east was always going to threaten Russia to the point that it bandwagoned with China. Now, Putin was a Europeanist. Everybody knew he was Eurocentric. He did not trust the Chinese. And for the last 15, 20 years, ever since I've been working in this field, we would keep, you know, how many official, semi-official, non-official delegations, we keep telling the Americans, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? You're pushing the Russians into Chinese hands. And they'd keep telling us, no, 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 you don't understand. Russia is too suspicious of China. You know, if you, if you look at their nuclear deployments and their anti-aircraft deployments, they're all across the Chinese border. They're not across the uh, uh, Barents Straits with America or across Europe, etc., etc., etc. We went on telling them, no, 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 no. For the last 15 years, we've been spending telling them not to do this. You hear about Russia saying not to do this to America. You have not heard about Indians saying this. And yet, I know I have personally been part of several delegations that went on telling them not to do it. And the standard response was, this is simply not going to happen. Okay. For one thing, it has now happened. The person who gets screwed the most in Ukraine is India. Because today... We were very, very happy till the 24th of February 2022 that China was stuck in a middle-income trap. It could not get beyond a certain level of resources and its innovation ecosystem had stalled because of that uh, uh, inverse uh, demographic table and all of that. Today, it suddenly got cheap and free access to the whole of Russia's minerals and commodities. So the Chinese empire, if it was on its hind legs, it has just gotten a 20, 30 year le extra lease of life. Okay. And because the Americans are screwing up so badly with domestic policy, remember, it's all relative. So America might have been here. China might have been here. In normal times, Russia by China might have been here. But the problem is when you are here and America is trying to come down here, then this isn't much. Okay. We are going to pay the heaviest price for this. Because now Russia is decisively in China's uh, uh, axis. Should we have been more forceful about NATO expansion and things like that? We probably should have. But, you know, we can't look beyond our own noses. So we never took it seriously. We never took it as a matter of policy. Uh, we could never articulate our concerns properly. Invariably, when it went to high-level diplomacy, apparently these concerns were never articulated. So uh, you might think what is happening, all of you are getting quite thrilled. I know India has more than its fair share of Russia enthusiasts who are absolutely thrilled by Russia, uh, Russia's spectacular successes of late uh, in Ukraine, at least in the last two, three days. But remember, India will have to pay the bill with compound interest in another 15 to 20 years. And I sure as hell hope we're ready for it because I worry we're not. Well, only time will tell. But uh, in a way, considering just one question and then I'm going to start uh, taking the viewers' questions. 
in this particular scenario as much as i'm opposed to non alignment as a thought process i think it actually kind of saved our ass short term it was a very well conceived policy but like all things it was destroyed in implementation hmm. had we stuck to the initial goal without posturing without being unnecessarily critical of america or being overly supportive of moscow mostly because of krishna menon hmm. we could have done it very well we could have gotten things out of both sides we did not hmm. okay now you tell me when krishna menon keeps accusing the americans of everything under the sun but then when the russians invade hungary in 1956 he goes and votes to support even though nehru told him to vote against it in the un he goes and votes to support the soviet invasion of uh, hungary how is it non aligned yeah then it isn't then it so isn't. a lot of it was a lot of internal indiscipline and a loss of path see it became a dogma by itself the original purpose of it was lost hmm so yes first uh, 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 non alignment was conceived very intelligently it was executed very very badly yeah but on, honestly my my question was just limited to how india has kind of done what it has done right now like i think small moves like listening to the americans sending some aid to ukraine also in a way getting a uh, russian oil at a discount uh i think we're, we're kind of being more see honestly what what i have understood non alignment is basically transactionalism you just have to be hardcore transactionalist where you but only see, look at interest but even there you are not looking at your own interest when the reset with america happened 30 years back remember in 1990 china wasn't that far ahead of you what prevented you from becoming china look one of the Industry. biggest reasons honestly we even after opening up we did not really reform the bureaucracy there were no real reforms yeah. in that sense china just waltzed through it and they industrialized now, the, now, the difference between so, us and so, china so, is industrialization exactly so why didn't we become the back door uh, sorry the uh, back end production for the american economy because the EU economy? because we hate america i i don't know how else to say this but our bureaucracy so hates the america thing. therein lies the problem see you you're transactional to the point of being stupid yes you you're penny wise and pound foolish yeah i agree so but so here it lies the problem everything is conceived brilliantly executed very very badly yeah uh, i it reminds me okay. of the 17th so, century now, story of the british going to the chinese giving them technology and the chinese say we don't need we we know everything yeah we know everything the british actually offered them that technology and they said fuck off the yeah. japanese were like and the japanese only got it 150 years later 100 years later so 1750 it was kangxi kangxi emperor who was given the offer of technology and he said you are a tiny you should tremble you're a little pip squeak when i fart you should tremble karke he wrote a really nasty letter to uh, you know you can still see that letter uh, in the versailles the letter that kangxi wrote to louis uh, 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 is still preserved out there i think it was louis the 14th or the 15th you can still see it saying you tremble i am the lord of earth and heaven you tremble and he says fuck you whereas by 1850 just well 1870 100 120 years later when commodore perry goes and forces the japanese economy to open the japanese are like ha bahut acha aur do aur do aur do and within the space of 35 years they crush russia at the battle of tsushima hmm. so it's it's uh, again india is like china that way is like qing dynasty china It's, oh yeah uh by in this 30 year period from 1990 to 2022 we should have gotten all the technology we could from america and by this time we should have been at least 12 to 15000 dollars per capita okay and then when the situation changes you suddenly say eh 
you know, I think it's time to return to non-alignment. Hmm. And there's no need for you to go along with American policy. So, for example, Singapore has refused to go along with American policies. They've imposed some minor sanctions on Russia, but nothing major. You look at Saudi Arabia and Israel. Emirates. Israel. Israel. They've all refused. Yeah. But only we are chided. They're not. Only we are chided. Hmm. Yeah, it's okay. Chal. Fata -fata answer karenge because we only have 15 minutes. Someone has said, uh, Abhijit ji, I politely disagree with you on the Britain thing because Britain was still taking silk, cotton and jute raw material from India to their mills. Innovation was not encouraged till they left. So we cannot. So what I think what they're trying to say is how do we quantify the cost of something like that where you just kill innovation in your society? Hmm. So what you do is I want you to Look at innovations as and when they happen. Look at which strata of society they're coming. Look at the Gini coefficient and things like that. Okay, wealth is a holistic concept. If it benefits somebody in Britain, but not everybody in Britain, today innovation in Britain can come from any strata of society. In those days, it only used to come from the top strata of society. Just like today, innovation in Sweden, Norway, Denmark only comes from a certain set and everybody else migrates out of those countries. Of course, in those days, you didn't migrate out of Britain. But innovation was restricted to the top end. There was no social mobility for a very long time in Britain. Even today, do you know Germany has the lowest social mobility of any country in Europe? So Britain, mm. you can, like I said, this is my interpretation. Remember, I told you right at the beginning, this is my interpretation of things. But there was a severe mismanagement of wealth that happened in Britain. Did the wealth extraction happen? Yes. On paper, did it seem like it was distributed? Yes. In reality, was it a sustainable distribution? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I Which is it. why. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, feel free to disagree. You don't have to politely disagree. You can call me all kinds of names and disagree also. That's okay. That's my interpretation. Yeah, yeah, we're used to it by now. Okay, so I think this is about the Mongols and all those periods. You're talking about those war strategies and stuff like that. So somebody has like asked Khwarezmia governor uh, executing Mongol spies was a disastrous. Was it a disastrous decision? Also, uh, Ashoka, as great as he was, him becoming a bhikkhu and seizing expansion isn't. Was it also a disastrous decision? I think you you were using analogies, right? So I guess they have asked, do you think uh, are these also bad decisions? Well, uh, look, uh, how people forget this, but the first capitalist was an Indian and the first socialist was also an Indian. Uh -huh. uh, I think we have discussed this kushal that Ashoka uh, Chanakya was the first capitalist, true capitalist, yeah. and uh, hawk, not market, and national a hawk. security not hawk. Not mercantilist. Remember, he was not mercantilist. He wanted production to go where it was most feasible to go. The government wasn't there to adjust uh, regional imbalances and things like that. Yeah. Okay, that was not the government's choice. So Chanakya was very clear about it. Chanakya was the father of the Austrian uh, School of Economics and what is uh, uh, the American Empire today. Okay. But... Ashoka was the father of Karl Marx, Mao Zedong, and Stalin. Yeah. So you, you, the very definition of my Bap state comes from Ashoka's Deva Nam Pia Pia Dasi. I am the beloved of the gods, the father to my people, etc. He keeps calling himself the father of his people. You're not the bloody father of your people. Mm. You're the chief executive. Stay at that. Yeah, I don't and get this he, straight thing yet. They why do they want to be our papa? We already have a papa, na. Huh? So remember, people don't realize this. The Mauryan Empire started collapsing during the lifetime of Ashoka, not after Ashoka. He was a socialist. He did to the Maurya economy what Hugo Chavez did to the Venezuelan economy. There is a reason that Nicolas Maduro is a Sai Baba Bhakt. I'm sure there was some Ashokan connection where which gravitated towards him towards India and he picked some kind of a Hindu spiritual guru. But Ashoka, Hugo, Chavez, same. Hugo, Ashoka, Ashoka, Hugo. Hugo, Ashoka, Ashoka, Hugo, Nicholas Maduro, Ashoka. Same thing. 
Okay. He took an extraordinarily prosperous economy and destroyed it to the point. Everybody talks about the Kalinga war. What they don't tell you is that Kharavela, the king of the Kalingas, came and sacked Patliputra just uh, 20, 30 years after uh, 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 the yes. Battle of Kalinga. Yes. Imagine yes. for a state that gets completely wiped out. They come and wipe you out after 20, 30 years. Yes. So much for pacifism. And, and you know, uh, if you talk to Razib Khan, he'll tell you that all the archaeological evidence shows you that living standards go down during the Maurya Empire. Because at the point of its greatest material wealth, which had accumulated just before Ashoka under uh, 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 Bimbisara, or was it Bindusara? I keep confusing Bindusara and Bimbisara. I think it's Bindusara, uh, not Bimbisara. Okay. You can literally see the collapse happening. You can see the living standards being destroyed by Ashoka. And that same policy of socialism keeps continuing under his successor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So it literally destroyed it. And that's very important that you realize that. So Ashoka is the actual, he is the godfather of socialist destruction and socialist bad policy. Hmm. All right. One more. Well, you were talking about China. So I'll ask you the China question and Indian attitudes. So don't you think India's policy in regard to Tibet and China is a disaster from the beginning? Or is our current policy or stance towards China slightly better than what we did in the past? It's a continuation. Nothing's really changed. No, but haven't you been on record for the one thing, the one place where you have, the only place where you have praised this government, Abhijit, uh, of all the uh, criticisms that you have levied against them, is the China thingy, right? The China thing in terms of protecting our own territory, right? So in terms of building infrastructure uh, to consolidate, you know, facts on the ground to show that you have physical ownership of the land, uh, in terms of focusing on air power to overcome Chinese uh, 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 superiority, etc. So militarily, I do not have that issue. The problem is in terms of diplomacy, economics, etc., etc. Where is the whole of the country's strategy to counter China? Yeah, magar so, uh, trade policy may be to improvement or let me thoda push back on this. I think hmm. smart decisions like specifically banning certain apps and many other things, I think they have done some positive the apps, movement. But but no 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 apps what percentage of the market did it affect in China? It didn't. Yeah. TikTok maybe, yes. TikTok was the one TikTok, good effect. Uh, well, uh, socially, yes. Even that is questionable because TikTok was the one company that when the government used to say ban, they would never push back. They'd ban immediately. Hmm. As opposed to say Twitter and Facebook, which will just refuse. They'll just withhold in India. But I, Abhijit, thoda, isme main thoda... Add Karunga, I think kuch strategically duties lagai gai hai, kuch industries may, and it has led to industrialization of certain products in India. If they become more viable than China, I have first hand experience as my friends are those industrialists. So, a kuch few, few, yes, so a few melamine, few, malo, tujo, melamine ki plates banti hai Gujarat mm -hmm. mein, wo puri industry mm -hmm. band ho gai thi, COVID ke baad, or last saat, che saat salo mein, wo puri industry revive ho gai hai. There's a lot in chemicals and things like that that has also been taken back from China. Uh, uh, chemicals that lead directly to pharmaceuticals and things like that. Uh, so there has been some work done. There is a lot more that is low-hanging fruit that can be done. There is a lot more that is diplomatic low-hanging fruit that can be done, which is not being done. I agree with you. That, 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 that I agree so, with you. That, I'm not going to debate that with you. Uh, so, ek minute. So I'm just trying to look at other questions. Ek minute, uh, okay, yeah, this is also because you spoke about mercantilism and economics and economic policy. So conservatives argue for little to no regulation and supply side economics. Does it mean we can entirely depend on the free market to regulate themselves and ensure that it will lead? I was talking about this question when you socialism. Ki baat kar tha. Toh, this was like, you have criticized socialism, kiya, magar what about capitalism as a fundamental policy decision also? Right. right. Now remember, no idea is ever perfect. 
Fair one enough. of the biggest fallacies in capitalism has been that self regulation is king it is god the no. so called free hand there is no free hand right wo jo there is wo no jo. free hand yeah so, so this is why i identify as a chanakyan economist not as a austrian economist because chanakya used to say chanakya was an austrian economist in everything except the regulation in the regulation he was like main state hu main i will rule you if you put one foot out of line i will crush you is china mm-hmm. more yes. chanakyan than us yes yes But i was just thinking china that. the problem is it's corrupt chanakya yeah it's Thanks. corrupt chanakyan because it did not allow the market to develop organically if you remember till 1989 when the tiananmen square massacre happens the growth of the chinese economy was organic anybody who had the entrepreneurship could find the capital could set up a factory and do what he wanted the demand was genuine demand it was private demand etc 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 uh uh but what dang xiaopang realized was that this was creating a middle class which was at the forefront of demanding personal freedoms which is why the ananmen square happened so he skewed the entire nature of the economy we are today even to this day 70% of demand in china is public public sector demand. and he made it so that you are completely dependent on the state for ever becoming successful mm-hmm. as a means of social control so dang xiaopeng might be the father of modern china but he also laid the root of its downfall there so you see what's happening with evergrande you see what's happening with the uh, uh uh irreconcilable failure of their train system which everybody in india goes gaga over uh you look at the almost certain irreconcilable failure of their financial system which nobody wants to talk about we all know is the reality he laid the roots for all of that mm. right so it's it, it it's it's one of those things where i don't disagree with you that capitalism has lots of faults and this is why you pick and choose you're never too dogmatic about it see because even in capitalism when the income gap grows it leads to social disharmony mm. and at that point you need some kind of wealth distribution to happen yeah now what is the difference and this is why i am big on human capital investment what is the difference between wealth distribution and human capital investment wealth distribution is unaccountable you're taking wealth and giving it to everybody human capital investment is taking that wealth investing it in people and making those people accountable for what you are investing in them hmm okay equality of opportunity not equality of result wealth distribution wants an equality of result human capital investment wants an equality of opportunity not of result got it so remember i also support some kind of socialism public spending on things like education primary education okay basic health care you, you can't be basic health care you can't be dogmatic left and dogmatic right and this is where the state's role in control you remember we spoke about this feudalism and how uh, feudal barons and things like that were actually the most opposed to democracy the magna carta was not a charter of freedom people in england were actually freer before the magna carta than they were after the magna carta king john essentially threw his own people to the wolves it was a charter of freedom for the biggest crooks around who were called the barons that is why you have robber barons okay mm-hmm. so that entire robin hood story is in that setting you know the sheriff mm-hmm. of uh, 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 what would the sheriff of lincolnshire no sherwood sheriff of sherwood and uh, king john evil king john good king richard it is all in that setting of excessive repression by the feudal barons the king is blamed but it's actually the feudal barons doing it so you do need the state as a regulator 
All right. I'll mix two, three questions uh, because a lot of them are nothing to do with uh, our chat and what. So I'm, I'm going to mix all of them. So how can we become the new China without collapsing with proper vision of the Indian future? And I'll continue this and add one more. What was the last good innovation in your view that came from the subcontinent? Uh, or is there anything new or innovate uh, that is coming as far as innovation is concerned? Uh, and are we heading towards industrialization or can we? So I've mixed them all together because they're all interconnected one or one way or the other. Look, the widow for industrialization is now finished. There's nothing you can do anymore. When America and Europe had huge capital surpluses, they outsourced it, uh, their industrialization to China. Today, they run on debt. And that's a very dangerous market to invest in now. So you can't base your industrialization on that anymore. And you don't have the economies of scale now to catch up with China anymore. Plus, now with 3D printing coming in at the level which you have to start, which is the lowest, the, the smallest. You know, China didn't become a big industrial power based on ships and heavy machines that it today is. It started making shoes, shoelaces, bulbs, uh, tampons, uh, sanitary napkins, uh, uh, disposable uh, tissue, pens, things like that, which we didn't want to do. We, we still don't want to do. We want high tech, high tech, high tech, high tech. Make in India ka kya hua? Does anyone see the Make in India lion anymore? Or is Ghunchu ko leja ke ab Niti Aayog ka chairman bana diya? Rewarding failure. Okay, so... We are not industrializing, not in my lifetime, not in your lifetime. Hamara future kya hoga Ram Bharose. Okay, which is why I would highly recommend you book your plot of land for uh, uh, your retirement in Varanasi to go do, to do uh, prayers and things like that on the banks of the Ganga because you never know what is going to happen anymore. Okay. So India is not going to industrialize. India cannot industrialize anymore because once 3D printing really, really starts taking off. It's first the lower levels, the easiest things to produce that get replaced. And slowly as it gets more and more and more complex, uh, once the quantum uh, uh, computing uh, uh, riddle is cracked, ultimately, uh, you will have no chance. That leapfrogging, you simply cannot do. Impossible. Uh, it's socially impossible. Uh, and, and the clearest example of that is uh, what I told you. Uh, 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 Belgium versus Italy. A agricultural workforce working in an industrial setting of southern Belgium can leapfrog into the information age. But an agricultural Sicily at the same level of human development as northern Belgium, which never industrialized, which lived off the surpluses of the north and refused to industrialize, refused to go work and initially was kept down, was not able to trans... Technically, what happened in to northern Holland, uh, northern Belgium, should have happened to southern Italy. Southern Italy should have leapfrogged into the information age and become the rich one. They did not. Why? Because an agricultural society cannot leapfrog into the information age. You then have information-enabled feudalism, which is very dangerous because it magnifies the effects of feudalism. Okay, so there's lots of issues like this. We we cannot. Uh, we have missed a lot of buses. All right. Ek tune book padiye in service of the nation: the art and science of economic policy by Kelkar and Shah. Padiye tune. Kisne pucha tha? You've not. Okay. So fine. I think I've asked all the questions that were related you know, it's to very that. Surprising that it, it's very surprising that you asked me to read it because just yesterday I was having this conversation uh, that I met somebody who worked with Shah. No, no. Somebody asked in the, uh, yeah, the questions that have you read that book? I have not. No, I have not. It's come. So I'm telling you. It's very curious that whoever raised this, raised this today. Because yesterday, I was at a dinner. Yesterday or day before, I forget. Uh, uh, no, yesterday. Hamara Nikhil Mehra hai na? Tweet in the call. Uske saath had gone out for a beer day before yesterday. 
Hmm. And he introduced me to a colleague who had worked with Shah, Shah Ajay Shah of this Kelkar Shah book fame. Mm-hmm. Who uh, I've been told to read that book, so I'm going to read it. Okay, good. All right. So okay, now we'll wrap up today's chat because there are two, three other questions which have nothing to do with the discussion. So I'm not going to ask them. I don't know why people ask these questions, but anyways. So as you see, this was part one. We've covered five. Now, if you have many more questions about this, you can leave your comments below. And also you can tweet at Abhijit. You're going to see the Twitter handle of Abhijit in the description. You can do that. In next month, we will do part two, where we look at other five as- aspects of uh, policy. Now you have an idea also how it's going to be. So you can also prepare your questions for that one accordingly. As always, Abhijit, pleasure talking to you, buddy. Jairam Ji ki Har Har Mahadev. Remember, Ayodhya to bas jaki hai, Kashi Vathra baki hai. Awesome. I, I totally endorse that, uh, that sentiment. All right, guys, we'll wrap today's discussion up. Uh, as always, please subscribe to the Charvak podcast channel, like the video, leave your comments, follow Abhijit on Twitter. Uh, keep making those nice videos that you always make on Abhijit. Also, um, I just told you guys about this mic that I'm using. So if you guys are interested, again, in the description, I'll leave the, kin, leave the link. Kharid na, kharid it's, also, no. oh. it's also available on Amazon. So you can also buy it off Amazon. Yeah, so uh, it's it's because I told you guys that the sound is coming. Apparently, live stream me told that the sound is coming. So, take it, take it, take it. Who wants to take it? I told them to try it. I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I don't have any money for this. I'm genuinely trying it. If it's good, then you guys take it. Take it. I think it's a reasonably priced too. Uh, also, please support the Charvak podcast. Become a member on YouTube or Patreon. Buy the merch on Kadak Merch or Kushalmehra.com. Or send me donations through UPI. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, take care. Bye. Bye.